Welcome one and all to the Friday, August 20th edition of the Signals from Mars live stream. I'm your host, Victor, and we are waiting on our guests here. Um, let's see. Let's see if we can get them to uh, join in. We I see Rob from the Rock and Roll podcast. How are you doing today, sir? Hope you are well. And hopefully we'll be joined momentarily by Margarita Monet of the band Edge of Paradise. Hello, Jeremy, up in the UK. <coughs> Saying Jeremy <laughs> almost made me choke. I don't know why. Maybe it was the uh, patron's pick of the day. I wasn't expecting him to go with melodic death metal. So that was a uh, a shock. I, I tend to not listen to uh, what Jeremy has picked until I actually put the show together because I do want to be surprised. And I'm listening to his pick and I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> oh shit, he picked death metal. Was not expecting it, and that's cool. Uh, Jeremy actually has a wide palette of things that he does um, that he does enjoy. It just isn't usually death metal or black metal or stuff like that, but he does tend to like a lot of other stuff, which is really cool. So um, there's that. Uh, I recorded the Patreon show today, the Victor M. Ruiz podcast, which if you subscribe to Patreon, to my Patreon, you get that show. And it's funny because I got to eat some crow. I mentioned that ministry was covering the Stooges search and destroy. And I said, why do we need another version of this song? So as I'm getting ready for the show, I actually listen to the song and I'm like, Oh wow. They totally like did it their own way. This sounds really cool. So I need to eat crow on that. It sounds really neat the way that they did it. So yes, we ministry created that one, uh, the, the, a version of the song search and destroy that we didn't know that we actually needed. So there you go. Okay. Well, we will wait to see if uh, Margarita can join us here. In the meantime, let's uh, let's go over some blabbermouth news here. Let's see. I kind of did this today, but uh, well, I didn't do the full thing because there's there's been a lot of other developments today. So um, let's share this real quick. So uh, if you are a patron and have listened to today's show, I talk about a lot of actual concert tours being canceled for various reasons. And it seems like stuff continues. Uh, we have Lamb of God's Randy Blythe urges fans to get vaccinated and wear a mask. Actually, let me do it like this. Um, Udo releases or UDO releases lyric video for new single Kids and Guns. Okay, Allison Chains Jerry Cantrell behind the scenes footage for making of a tone video. A song that I enjoyed, not every patron dug it, but is what it is. Corn's Jonathan Davis is on the mend after contracting COVID-19. So, oh, and I see that Margarita is now joining us. So we will put the news aside. And we will welcome Margarita Monet to the show. How are you? Hi, I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. It's awesome to have you on. Um, it's funny because I was looking through my notes and I realized that 
I haven't spoken to you since December of 2011. So it's almost been 10 years. Oh, wow. That's a long time. Yeah, it was when you guys were, I think it was right before Mask came out. Wow. Um, so a lot has uh, has definitely changed in the band, has it not since Mask? <laughs> it's been, feels like a lifetime. Absolutely. It's funny because I still go back and listen to a lot of the, the songs off of that album. And I mean, songs from throughout your career. Um, you're, it, se <laughs> it seems like you're, um, I don't want to say you're blushing, but with me saying, going back to that, obviously the band is sonically and from the composition standpoint has in 10 years has done quite a lot. Oh yeah, we actually took mask off of our Spotify. <laughs> just oh, because, you did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then people still they tried to get that album. We're like, no, just listen to the new stuff. It's just because uh, well, we sound so much different now. And mask, right. um, I didn't write any of the songs. I started writing songs with our next album with Dave. Um, mm -hmm. Our first song we wrote together, and that was our album Immortal Vault. So <laughs> Mask was written with Dave and Robin McCauley, but I think it just gave me a chance to discover myself as a singer, I would say, because okay. I never Oh, wow. I, I didn't know that. So was he looking to record that album with Robin McCauley originally? Well, he had a band with Robin called Bleed, and they actually did record a lot of those songs. And they oh, released okay. Yeah. But some of them they never released because... It was Robin in the band with Greg Bisson on drums and Tony Franklin on bass. Oh, wow. Um, did some shows together, but um, they all, like, Robin went on tour with Survivor. It was back then when Survivor split. So he right. went on tour with player for Survivor. Uh, Greg Bisson was touring with Ringo Starr. So everybody was doing their own thing. Yeah. And uh, Dave, like, we both wanted to do something and commit everything to that and take it you know all the way basically so that's what we uh, that's why we started the band um, but it took us a few years to really like discover what we wanted to sound like and you know like like with any band yeah so. absolutely and, and even you're bringing that up and you're talking about immortal walls but i gotta tell you this album here if i can get it <laughs> on screen <laughs> universe to me, was really a huge leap forward for the band. Oh, I yeah. mean, yeah, it it really to me was really you guys coming into your own and really, as you're saying, kind of finding your way, kind of finding how all the pieces finally fit. How difficult was it for you guys to finally get to the point of universe and and realize what you wanted to do there? Yeah, I don't know if it was difficult per se. It was just kind of a natural evolution. And okay. I think uh, we really found ourselves as songwriters <laughs> because um, like with our EP Alive, it started heading into that direction. And then we kind of just followed the music because we liked what was developing. Like we never mm -hmm. formed anything ever. Uh, like we never thought to ourselves let's sound like that because i feel like that never works once you force something it's very hard to make it work so i just feel grateful that we were able to find that path and just uh, we also uh, were lucky to uh, start working with mike plodnikov and jacob hansen i feel like he really saw where we were heading and steered us into that direction and then i started discovering like more of the cinematic because I, I play keyboards and all the songs so i really started to discover all the stuff i like to do with the keyboard like all the industrial sounds all the cinematic sounds and we just kind of went with it so. yeah that's kind of neat that you mentioned that because it's funny when i get press releases about you guys and they try to describe the band. It really, at least in my opinion, I think Edge of Paradise sounds like Edge of Paradise, where it doesn't, you know, people want to say it's symphonic metal or it's industrial or it's this. I think that you guys have pieces of different things, 
but I think that you guys do a good job of kind of taking all the ingredients of the recipe and making it Edge of Paradise. Yeah, thank you. That's a really huge compliment to us because from the beginning, that's what we always strive to do. We wanted to create something unique enough that people, when they hear first part of our songs, they can recognize that it's us. So, uh, so yeah, thank you for saying that. And I hope, you know, we'll, we'll keep evolving. Um, I really like the theme we have going with the band, like this kind of futuristic sci-fi <laughs> type of theme. And also like the new album, it's very thought provoking. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, want to keep going into that direction, but thank you. Yeah. How, how do you feel that you guys have stepped up your game from universe to the unknown? Uh, well, actually, it's a huge uh, <laughs> leap forward for us again to this album, just because, well, first of all, the songs are a lot more meaningful, I feel like. Uh, they're also more cinematic, like overall. I always <laughs> kind of describe them as, like, if you like movies like Inception or Interstellar or Star Wars, it's like every song is like a mini movie like that. Um, they're a bit story driv driven. Also, each song is very versatile. Um, like the album is very versatile. Um, each song is very different, but overall, you really feel like it's one album. And, um, you know, also we have, uh, we started working with Howard Benson, who is um, a multiple Grammy winner, producer. He uh, also with Neil Sanderson from Three Days Grace. I feel like working with Neil just because Three Days Grace is so different from us. Like I always do everything very elaborate, very like, uh, uh, he, like I like to really read into things and Three Days Grace, they have like this approach where everything is streamlined. And I think we found like the happy medium where it's still us, but it's it's very like everything is in the song because it needs to be there. Like there's nothing filler about it. So I think overall, with us evolving as musicians and with our production team growing, um, we stepped up a whole new level. So gotcha. So how important do you feel was it was the input from from the three of them? You're saying that Neil kind of helped streamline things, but you know, again, it's Howard isn't the first big name producer you guys have worked with. You worked with uh, Michael Wagner in the past. Um, you also worked with, um, is it Chuck Jones, the name of the, uh, who, the guy that produced the live? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what do you feel that this kind of three headed team helps, helps do for you guys that maybe you hadn't been able to do in the past? Yeah, you know, it's always like Dave and I, we pretty much do a lot of it ourselves, but um, working with other people, even though like a lot of the songs, for example, we demo them up at home. So the songs are pretty much written. Um, but for example, I'll, I'll kind of tell you the process so you can sure. get an um, So we demo it up at home. Then we go to Mike Plotnikov, Mike Produced Universe. Mike is a very, he, he really inspires the process because when I record with Mike, he really pushes me to think outside the box. So on the spot, I really think of maybe some new melodies that are better and maybe some new words that are better. So we really evolve the song and solidify it. And then when Neil was, uh, Neil was zooming in from Canada um, during the sessions with Mike, and he was kind of like, oh, this isn't maybe necessarily, maybe this is too many words. Maybe take out some of this stuff. So Neil was kind of that um, part of the process where he was taking things out. <laughs> um, and then I went to Howard to record the final vocals to some of the singles. And uh, because we kind of met Howard more later in the game, like the album was pretty much done. But then I w we recorded a lot of the songs with Howard and he really pushed me vocally because I think he saw a side of me. He saw like this edge I, I didn't have before and he really brought that out. And I feel like that really made the songs a whole new level. Plus we 
put a lot more harmonies like the songs got a lot more production <laughs> with Howard and that also really elevated the choruses especially like I think you can really hear that on Digital Paradise even though it's subtle but when I hear both versions it's like a massive difference um so <laughs> yeah we're, we're grateful we have all these people now kind of part of the team cool you're obviously a very creative person you've always uploaded things videos of you playing the piano doing covers of you know you guys are offering all types of really cool things that people can buy as part of bundles for the unknown um universe came out in august of 2019 about two years ago and a few months later the pandemic hit so things kind of halted for you guys oh, yeah. um the unknown was it born out of the need for you guys to do something during that time were the songs already there or i mean with you guys being so creative did you just need to write these songs yeah it's a bit of bit of everything of that because we were supposed to tour a lot right. in 2020 uh, but we knew after we came back from tour in europe uh we had we knew that we had a few months off and we're always writing um so we always have that need to keep making music so we were like well things are kind of weird right now you know but we're not worried like <laughs> who knew a pandemic would would last this long um right. but we just called up mike and we were like you know we have this one song we'd like to get in the studio and maybe do a single before the tour you know something like that and he was like okay yeah let's good that's great so that's how we started and then um, you know one song led to the other song and then we were like what's going on like i was driving on the freeway in la and it was deserted like who ever sees an empty freeway in los angeles um, right. so at home like uh, that's when i wrote the title track the unknown and then dave came and he was like um that's a different song because i think the unknown is probably one of the like we never wrote a song like that before so i think the pandemic just like this apocalyptic atmosphere <laughs> kind of influenced the process but i think it's the first time that we never we didn't really have anything else to do like we didn't have a tour to prepare for because like things just got canceled we were holding out hope to the last minute but as we knew that everything canceled we just focused on the music entirely and that did keep us sane <laughs> throughout <laughs> the year. Um, but yeah, we just kind of fully immersed ourselves in this album. So cool. Um, could you envision that with how things continue to go that if you can't get out there and play that you guys would continue to write, uh, as time goes on? Yeah. Yeah. We always try to write in, in between, but I know like, we were just bummed that we didn't really get to tour on universe. Right. But I think this album was the silver lining for us because we did, I feel like these are definitely our best songs so far. Um, like The Unknown, to me that song is so important. I feel like it's one of those songs you write once in a lifetime. Just just personally, how much it means to me. And then, uh, um, you know, also starting to work with these new people and uh, because we're also signed they have a label now so we kind of signed with judge and jury so we have like frontiers uh, on our team and judge and jury so a lot of good things happen to the band and um this is what i kind of uh, you know i want to say with the album as well because the album is very it talks a lot about futuristic topics and just um it's sci-fi in a way uh, mm -hmm. but no and like the heart of the song is inside the silence of my mind i find strength in the unknown so if we you know kind of look in a positive way um into something we don't know what's going to happen you know find kind of hope in it so right. that's kind of us. cool um yeah you you mentioned that the songs are very futuristic. The videos are very futuristic as well. And one thing that you've always pushed as well is 
you guys have had a certain image with all the videos. I mean, the videos aren't you guys just standing there, just kind of uh, miming the songs. You, you guys are actually, they look like little cinematic pieces as well. Uh, how involved are you guys in creating these videos? Do you guys come up with a storyboard and then look for somebody to help you guys develop it? Or do people come to you to with ideas for the songs? Uh, well, a lot of it goes like this. I'm like, hey, Dave, I want to make this video and it's going to look like this. And he's like, how are we going to do that? I'm like, oh, man. Oh, okay. I'll just call up Scott. Hey, Scott, like, I have these creepy ideas. Can we make it happen? He's like, okay. I'm like, okay, let's do it then. And Dave's like, oh, my God, how are we going to make it happen? And then I'm like, okay, it's booked. <laughs> so, and then, like, we just have to figure out how to make it happen. But a lot of it is kind of like that it's just because i always want to create something that's really grandiose and obviously we don't have huge budgets to do that you know as the band grows um i want to do bigger and bigger and bigger so we were able to kind of step it up with each video but yeah like i come up with some of these ideas uh, some videos, for example, when, when we worked with Scott Hansen, who did The Unknown and Digital Paradise, I uh, kind of talked to him about what I wanted the videos to be like, some of the scenes, like the, you know, the overall feel of the video. And then he kind of uh, helped me along the way to make it happen. And, you know, he brought his crew and uh, we just kind of figured it out together. So he was really great because he's a filmmaker, so he knows how to make things look the way I want them and work with what we have. And then like some videos, for example, my messenger madness, I pretty much did a lot of it myself and I got um, Dane, uh, Dane Mayan to film it and then I edited it myself. Like the video that we have coming out, False Titles, that one's really crazy because it looks like we're in ancient Egypt and then we're also in the future. <laughs> that one's like going really crazy. And that one, I worked with Robin August, who's also a filmmaker. And I just told him all the ideas I had. I booked all the stuff. And then he just was there to help me make it happen. So, you know, a lot of the videos I am very hands-on, but I also love collaborating with people and I'm totally fine with just letting someone, you know, do it. <laughs> but so far, um, we've been very involved in the process. Cool. What about uh, your wardrobe? Because you're wearing some outrageous stuff that obviously you can't go into any store and just buy. I'm assuming that somebody's either putting this stuff together or you're doing it or um, <laughs> a lot of the stuff myself okay but, um i mean internet is a beautiful thing <laughs> there's so many really cool designers out there that like i love to collaborate with so i just like if i see something online you know i uh, message them and i'm like uh, maybe if you help me customize it this way so it fits the video better or it's something that already fits perfectly. So there's a lot of really amazing people out there on the internet that maybe you don't see like in stores or whatever, but they make their own stuff and, you know, they sell it online. So I love finding, you know, designers that do really unique things. And, uh, you know, I get that for the video or like I make some of my own stuff, like a lot of the props I made myself, um, like in Digital Paradise, those crazy sleeves or like <laughs> the Pyra Pyramid and the Unknown video, I made that out of resin. So I make a lot of it myself. I mean, I like doing that, but also sometimes when you have an idea and you don't know where to get it, you have to make it yourself. Right. <laughs> yeah. Part of the problem of being so creative is that <laughs> you, you've got things in your head, but if if you can't have someone else kind of bring it to life, you got to do it yourself. And, you know, the way things are now, um, like you're saying on the Internet, there are so many guides to I mean, this is kind of different, but you see people recreate through cosplay like things that have been in books or things that have been in comics or whatever. So there are supplies out there and there are plenty of tutorials out there to build a lot of this stuff. So it's just cool hearing that you're able to make a lot of the stuff come to life. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's the fun part of things. The only problem is 
the time. <laughs> like right. I just <laughs> video and I had to upload it and just missed the deadline because it comes out on Monday. So <laughs> uh, it's the time that I'm always chasing. But other than that, it's super fun. Okay. And when did you say the next video was coming out? Monday. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It, it cut out there for a second. So I wasn't sure if that was the video you were discussing. Mm -hmm. um, are there going to be any other videos for the album or is it just going to be these four for now? Um, no, there's going to be more. <laughs> I wish, I mean, in the perfect world, I like to make a video for every song just because every song is so cinematic in its own way. So there's definitely going to be more and, um, uh, probably before the end of the year, okay. but yeah. So, you know, the more we, we, we're able to do, the more we'll do. Cool. Yeah. Um, given that again, you didn't get to tour universe properly. What could you envision your set list to be? Do you already have a set list worked out, uh, more or less of songs that you want to play? Um, do you want to give more of a chance to those songs off of universe that maybe didn't get played as much and mix them with stuff from the unknown? I mean, what, what's the, the plan at the moment? Yeah. Well, like the title track universe is still doing good on, it has a lot of support on Spotify. So we'll definitely play that one. I mean, I love a lot of the songs from universe. I guess the first step is to figure out what tours we're going to get on for the new sure. year. Like we were supposed to tour in September in the UK, but uh, you know, <laughs> there's still a lot of restrictions and a lot of the shows started canceling again. So that's where we're right. holding off here. Um, but yeah, it's gonna depend on like how much time on the set list we have because we're most likely gonna be part of a tour. So we're definitely gonna play a lot of the unknown album but definitely include some of the songs maybe three songs from universe oh, okay cool that's awesome um yeah. the band has obviously outside of you and dave has changed members throughout the years uh how much of a challenge is it to find the right mix of people to kind of drive your your vision and dave's vision forward with your music uh, it's it's very hard just because we really give our life to the band and it's hard to find people that can um, offer you know similar commitment like David Ruiz who is our rhythm guitar player he's been in the band for a while now too for probably over five years now um, so he's in it for you know for the long term um, you know like over the past few years like the most of the changes have been due to us either touring and someone like vanya for example he couldn't really commit to long-term touring and we had like the whole 2020 planned out so you know that was kind of the reason but now we have jamie moreno who is our drummer and he is he's an amazing drummer he's really creative and he is like in it for the long term so i feel like he's really going to be in the band for the you know he's like the uh permanent member and then we just got our bassist justin blair we had ricky bonazzo play on the album but he is the bassist for butcher babies so oh. butcher will tour a lot so that's why we, you know we wouldn't be able to have the same bass player so we recently got Justin to be the member, you know, he'll be touring with us and hopefully he'll be with us for the long term. So, but yeah, it's, it's pretty, and you would think in LA it's easy to find people, but it's so hard to find someone who can commit, who can fit the lineup, who can have great personality, plays great. <laughs> like, it's very, very hard. It's funny because I've, through various musicians that I, speak to either you know that i've had them on the show or that i speak to them through you know messages or, or whatever behind the scenes that seems to be a common theme for a lot of bands where they say that well you'd think in la there would be more people that would believe in doing this but there's so many people that are in three four or five different bands and then you have others that aren't sure that they want to commit to it as you know as a career so um it sounds weird but it's you know it's obviously a common thing that 
a lot of bands out there have to deal with. Yeah, I think and some people, um, like when you're in a lot of bands, it's almost like you're just spreading yourself too thin because it's very hard to keep a band going forward and to bring a band to like the highest level. I, I really have no idea how people can be more than one band. Like sometimes people like, you have other projects. I'm like, I can barely like survive <laughs> doing this because it takes so much time and effort and dedication to really move something forward. Like I have no idea how people can do more than one band. So I think part of it is really that finding people who really understand what it takes and can commit so it moves forward. Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> no, that, that it makes sense. I mean, when I've when I've heard it described, you know, when I've had people say it to me, I'd always think, "Wow, you know, I had when I was growing up, I couldn't focus on more than one band because I just didn't. There weren't enough hours in the day to try to do more than one." And I think you would want to do the best that you can, you know, if you're serious in a band. So, I mean, I don't know. Just yeah. weird. <laughs> um we have a, a patron of mine who wasn't going to be able to be part of the show tonight wouldn't be able to be in the chat so he asked a question ahead of time um so he wanted to ask you to describe what your vocal training background is um yeah so actually you know, not a lot because I grew up playing classical music and I grew up in Russia. So I went to a music school. So we had choir, we had theory. So I really know music. Um, and I, you know, they taught us about the technique of singing, but I never growing up, never really thought of becoming a singer. So when I went to college, like I did some musical theater in, in my high school, but you know, in high schools, they don't really push you unless you find like a really amazing teacher. But no one really pushed me. I actually got kicked out of musical theater. <laughs> they were like, you'll be better in theater. Like you have this dramatic thing about you, like do some dramatic monologues and stuff. <laughs> so I feel like no one really saw something in me and tried to develop it. I kind of did it myself. When I went to college, I also went, I went to NYU for theater. And we did, we had the breathing class. It was speech class. And we did tons of breathing exercises. Like we really did a lot with speech. And I feel like that really helped me because a lot of what singing is, is your lungs. Like you really have to have strong lungs to have a powerful voice. So that trained me a lot. I feel like put me on the right path to just becoming a singer. But it's not so like we did mask that I really was like, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna have to be the best I can. So like I heard things in my voice that I wanted because I was a musician my whole life. So I know what sounds good. And I knew what I had to do to sound good. And I just like figured out how to really push myself and really get rid of any limitations I had in my head. Like if I heard something I had, like if I heard a note that I felt like it was impossible to reach, I just figured out how to reach it and just kept doing it until it felt natural. And with each album, my voice kept evolving because I just never felt like, like I never said to myself, I can't do that or I'm not going to sound good doing that. I just figured out how to make it sound good. So I feel like that helped me to evolve. And um, yeah, just don't put in your, don't put in your <laughs> bricks, you know, on your path. Just feel, see the goal and just keep going towards it. Um, but I feel like it's helpful to have a vocal coach just to help them guide you too, if you, if you're able to. So. Okay. Yeah, that. That sounds absolutely crazy to me because some of the notes that you end up hitting on some of these songs, um, it's really, really amazing that you took that approach to get to where you've been able, you know, where you've been able to go. Um, there's definitely melodies and certain things that you do in your voice that again, like I said earlier, you know, there's, I kind of have something in my mind as to what, 
certain genres of metal should sound like or how they typically sound like. So when they brand you guys as a certain thing, the first thing that comes to mind is Margarita's voice isn't that. Her voice isn't this either. It's your voice is your voice. And it's almost like a lost art where, you know, back in the all the way up to probably the 90s where you if a band was good, you heard the singer and you're like, oh, it's so and so. Whereas now, you know, we get people get pigeonholed. Oh, well, um, they're a symphonic metal singer. So they have to sound like this band or the other band or, you know, so on and so forth. So it's cool to hear you describe not only how you guys came upon a lot of the music, like describing how you wrote the unknown, but just describing how you kind of transitioned from being, you know, someone in theater to someone that was a, a full on singer that, I mean, you honestly just blew my mind with describing all that. So I, I, I think it's really cool. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm almost roughly because I always hear melodies. Like I write a lot of melodies on the piano because I'm like, that's what I've been doing my whole life. So it's super natural for me. And then I think I just kind of replicate that with my voice. Um, but you know, like it's a really good point that you made that everything kind of gets into a box. And I feel like it's harder now to be more original these days because of how the music is marketed. Because if you don't fit a certain mold, it's much harder to break through. And uh, we kind of face that a little bit ourselves just because it, it would be much easier to sound exactly like this band or exactly like that band because you'll get on those tours, you'll get on those Spotify playlists or, you know, or that or this just because it's already so familiar and you're just kind of following the carved out path. So if you kind of carve your own path, it's, I feel like it's more rewarding at the end, but it's much harder <laughs> to carve it yourself. Right. Yeah, I agree. But if, if we look back at all of the classic bands that all of us listen to or that we grew up with or that we still listen to, the majority of them don't sound alike. Well, exactly. Yeah. Like back, back then when, bands were like imagine black sabbath like or metallic or led zeppelin like who are who do they sound like they sound like themselves you know and i feel like back then uh, it was uh, you know it was just a way to be uh, you create something um you know you strive to create something original so i don't know is music business of all i feel like it's the business end of things that kind of yeah. pushed you do you know to do something that's a little more i don't want to say copying other people but I, I feel like it's just the way the fact that it is harder to be more original puts people on a path to kind of follow in a trend but i don't know it's it's so hard to say these days because um <laughs> it's just not an easy thing to do being in a band so yeah yeah no, I, I agree with you. There's there, there are a lot of things, and it, it is. It's from the marketing standpoint where, uh, oh, well, Margarita is a female singer, so obviously she sounds like another female singer, another band with another female. And it's like, no, it doesn't matter if you're a female or not. It doesn't matter. You know, I had a, um, a conversation with the guitarist of a band that's out there in L.A. called uh, Tetrarch, and their guitarist – um, is an African American female. And I asked her, I said, you know, you're a, you're a female in a male dominated genre. B, you're also African American. Um, do you feel any pressure with having to represent or be this or be that? And she said, no, I just want to be known as being a musician. Um, if people recognize me for being a female, that's great. If people recognize me for being African American, that's great. But I want people to appreciate me for the music that I make. So mm -hmm. like you're saying, a lot of it is marketing where, oh, we have to point this out. But I think at the end of the day, do you really have to point it out? As long as the music is good, I, I don't think you need that extra like thing to, you know, it, again, back back in the day, if someone just had a great voice, you didn't have to point out, oh, well, he's from Scotland. You know, no, the band <laughs> is good. You know, it's to me, it's kind of the same thing. It just it's adding other things that 
kind of doesn't make sense. That isn't anything that's going to accentuate the music. Yeah, I think it's just part of the society we live in now. Um, everything has to be labeled. So, yeah. you know, when I first started the band and someone asked me for the first time, what is it like to be a female in a band? I thought it was such a weird question because like when I grew up in Russia, all the girls played piano. Like it was just a thing to, you know, you have to do. So I always saw musicians, other women musicians. I just didn't put the two and two together that in rock music, it's more male dominated. Like, yeah, of course, you know, I knew that, but I just never thought of it that way. So I just, I always felt comfortable. I just wanted to really let the music do the talking. So I always thought it was weird when people ask me, like, well, you're a female front of Like, why does that matter? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, I agree. Um, circling back to the unknown, I mentioned previously that you've put a bunch of different things together that are available on the site, different bundles, different things that you've handmade. Um, what are the, some of the, in your opinion, some of the neatest things that you've made uh, as part of these bundles? Well, I'll show you one thing, but I'm painting. So for example, um, this is actually a painting for the title track. The unknown. So I did a, painting for each song and as bundles um it's a canvas print of the original painting and the paintings actually ended up with our producers uh digital paradise went to mike and uh, my message and madness went to howard but this one i'm giving away because we're doing a guitar giveaway to everybody who put the album and this is going to be another giveaway item uh, so the original painting someone's going to win it uh, but yeah, I'm going to paint a pic, you know, an art piece for each of the songs, uh, just because I really like to visualize the song. Um, and uh, I also like in the unknown, you see that pyramid. Mm -hmm. um, I made that myself and I'm actually making more of that for some of the bundles that's going to come later on. And it's kind of like it's almost like a night lamp because I put a light inside so you can actually turn it on and see all the crazy things inside that pyramid. Um, then I made resin coasters with the artwork inside. It's kind of like immortalized because it's in a resin. Uh, but yeah, those are some of the things I made. Um, like last for Universe, I did box sets where I painted a picture on the box for every song and there was like a limited edition thing so I, I think i made 20 of them um yeah so you know it's fun i think eventually like towards the end of the year i'm going to put together an art book with just of these paintings and the lyrics for the album um because i have an art book of all my past paintings and people seem to like it so i think it'll be fun to make one but this album so dedicated so, yeah. Awesome. Uh, as far as the the actual vinyl, it's being released in multiple colors, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's actually just released in blue, but oh, okay. I love because the artwork inside is really cool. So I really can't wait for people to hold it in their hands and like, and we have our own um, alien language that was created by Dresden Seven. And uh, we like, for example, in this painting, if you see, um, like, see, these are like our symbols. So if you have the cipher, which comes with everything you buy from us, you can um, decipher all these hidden messages <laughs> we write in our merch. Um, yeah, so yeah, and we have cool t-shirts, um, but yeah, it's fun. Cool. Where should people go to pick the album up? Is there a preferred spot, your website? Should they go to Frontier's site? Where, where do you guys prefer? Yeah, well, we have one link. that If they go to our website or just Facebook, you can find the link pretty much everywhere. Um, and it gives you all the places you can get one. Like if, uh, you know, if you obviously want something signed, um, for example, all the vinyls that come from us, we're including a poster inside. Everything is always signed and personalized. We'll always include some gifts. Um, so that comes from our store, which is edgeofparadisestore.com. If you live in Europe and you don't really want anything signed, just want the album, um, you can get it from Frontiers Europe store. 
um, because then you don't have to pay for shipping from the US. So you can get that from Frontier's store, our vinyl or the CD. Uh, then uh, um, you can also get it on Amazon, iTunes, pretty much anywhere. It just depends if you want it signed or not. If you want it signed, get it from us. If you want it just regular, <laughs> get it from wherever you get your music. Yeah, there, there are a few of us that are in Europe. I'm sure it's not a case of us uh, not wanting it signed. It's just that the shipping is usually just so much that... Yeah, it's crazy. Like a lot of the bundles from last time, because um, we don't want to charge people so much for shipping, so we try to kind of um, cover the cost of it a little bit, but I feel like the prices keep going up. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I went to go pre-order an album the other day. It was only going to be released in the States. It was 21.97 euros and the shipping was 29 something. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be paying more for shipping than the album. So, Wow. Yeah, it sucks. It really sucks. Yeah, so that's why I mean, we're really grateful to have Frontier so people are able to get the physical CDs without paying the shipping costs. So. Okay, cool. That's where I'll, that's who I'll be giving my money to. Um, <laughs> and we also like, we always send out postcards because postcards are easy for us to send out because you just pay the stamp. So if you order it on, in Europe, just message us your um, shipping address and we love to send like an autograph postcard or like a band photo or something like that. Because we love to do that with I, I believe, and I have to look through because I have a box with all the promo stuff that I've been sent over the years. I believe that when I interviewed you 10 years ago, you actually sent me a, a bunch of postcards. So probably did. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as where people should keep in touch with you or in touch with the band to know whether there's going to be touring, whether there's going to be more bundles or more things available if the book comes out in the future things like that where should people go to keep up well we're a very social band <laughs> we like to spread our world so facebook instagram uh, you can also get on our mailing list which is on uh, if you go to our website edgeofparadiseband.com you can sign up for the mailing list but yeah I mean, we're very easy to find and we're, we're very social like we love to hear from people and we love to meet them at the shows like we always come out after a show and you know hang out with everybody because it's just it's part of what we really love to do is like sharing the music with people and just you know kind of building this world of edge of paradise uh so yeah just message us on instagram or facebook or twitter if you just search edge of paradise we should come up with all um, on all the platforms gotcha yeah. okay and the last thing i wanted to ask you about a few years ago you were involved um in something with um a foundation that uh, kevin estrada had put together for um, human trafficking. I actually know Kevin from when I was 19, um, when I worked in college radio. He was the metal director at Hollywood Records at the time, so I knew him from way back when, and I've kind of kept in touch with him over the years. He's an extremely busy guy. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your involvement in that and what that foundation was all about? Yeah, Kevin is such a great friend. Like his. He helped us out a lot and we just became really great friends along the years. Uh, we've probably known him for like eight years now and um, he, he, he has two daughters and it was called Rockers, it's still, you know, it's still active, Rockers United Foundation um, and he's very pa passionate about, um, you know, human trafficking especially since it, a lot of it happens right under our noses in Los Angeles. So. Um, the foundation was to raise money to help rescue some of these victims because a lot of the times the private investigators had to be hired and um, like the money that we raised actually saved two girls. Um, so yeah, it's something that's really close to his heart just because he does have two girls and it's something he really cares about. And like we, some of the shows, I think Papa Roach played one of the shows and he, we did two, 
two or three shows to raise money for it. Yeah, and um, it's always great to see that people, you know, they come out and support and all the money goes straight to, you know, helping to rescue these victims. Such a shame and it's a great cause, obviously. You know, you would think that in 2021, things like that wouldn't exist, but unfortunately it does. Because with technology and I feel like it's, yeah, and it's just like right under our noses. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like the police can't even approach these people. So like people have to go undercover to really like, you know, try to save these girls. It's really crazy. Yeah, there was a, a case here in Spain. I actually met the person before this actually happened to them. There was, um, uh, she was like a Pamela Anderson lookalike, but she was a DJ and she was hired to DJ. She was supposed to be doing a tour of China. And once she got to China, they locked her up in a room and they like cuffed her neck and her, her, hands and ankles the whole deal and she was in there with someone for like two months and they were able to escape and the whole thing was that they were going to be sold off um to to someone else within the country and it was brought to light that you know that uh there there are like groups in asia specifically that target people that are you know, semi-celebrities on the internet and invite them to partake in events or things like that. And their idea is that they're going to go to some, you know, yeah. posh hotel and they end up, you know, in a dungeon somewhere and being sold off. So, uh, this. So crazy. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, I appreciate your time. Margarita, I really wanted to talk to you when Universe came out because I enjoyed the album so much. I am very much looking forward to the unknown. And I know that a lot of the people that I have in the chat right now are as well. I've been posting the videos up there on my Patreon page and I've been getting a good reaction back from the patrons regarding the songs. So uh, I think that there will be more than one of us that will be checking the album out when it comes out. So. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for the support. And yeah, we're super excited to share this music and hopefully see you guys live at the shows. So thank you so much, Victor. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks again for your time. And um, I will be, I'll send you the links along when, uh, when this posts, it'll probably post within a week. So awesome. I'll share it everywhere. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks Margarita again for your time. Thank you for your time. Great talking right. to you. Likewise. All right. See you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Okay. So there we go. Margarita Monet of Edge of Paradise. Uh, seriously, I was not bullshitting her when I said that. When she described her process of how she gets her, her voice, I'm getting goosebumps describing this. She can hit certain notes that are just ridiculous. There, there are, there's, talk about certain pop singers and different people that can do certain things with their voice. Her voice is ridiculous. That's why when people bring up, Oh, uh, Nightwish and this and that, and, um, um, within temptation and they're grouped in with these bands. My first thought is, well, outside of the marketers making a big deal out of, uh, her being a female and the singers of the other bands being females. I don't get the correlation because Dave's guitar style is so different. All the other stuff that they do in the background of the music is just so different from those other bands. And I don't feel that it's cookie cutter at all. And maybe, I mean, I don't know. I've, I've liked this band from, from, from the get go. It's, it was interesting to hear her talk about mask and how it's no longer up there on social media. When I moved over to Apple Music, I did have to upload songs from that to my library so that I could listen to it. Um, one of the places where I tried to promote the interview in the past few days, I did actually use the song Mask. It's just the opening riff to the song. But um, yeah, ultra cool. Uh, 
was awesome to to talk to her and awesome to have you guys along for the ride jeremy uh gabe that joined us a little later and um rob Rowe is in here as well i don't think i'm missing anyone mike jones did send that question beforehand uh at the moment the next oh and jose actually um said hello earlier on i was talking to margarita and trying to get her on and um and didn't say hello so i do apologize for that um next week we're supposed to have russell from the ugly kings they're a band out of australia who i featured on my new releases post last week uh, again i had posted videos of those of theirs in patreon if you go if you if you are a patron and you do a search within my patreon page and just put the ugly kings all the videos will come up there's a lot of cool stuff there it's it's a real interesting mix because it's um it's it's definitely blues based it's definitely you know it's definitely feels like danzig feels like queens of the stone age but there are parts that sound nothing like those two bands at all so it should be a, an interesting discussion with russell next week and and let's see i don't know how early it is in australia because it will be morning there if he's on the east coast i believe it'll be 8 a.m if he's on the west coast it'll be 5 a.m so we'll see i've had that happen in the past so um i did release last week's episode today i did release the um patreon episode today as well the victor m ruiz podcast if you aren't a patron if you're listening to this and want to listen to that uh you can for as little as two dollars a month that is a weekly show uh that i release on patreon apart from this podcast uh, i also co-host a few things with mark striegel on his patreon and um and that's pretty much it uh, for now. Galaxy of Geeks is on hiatus. Hopefully we will be back in September at some point, but we'll see. We may be moving that to the Fireside platform. If any of you guys are fans of that, just follow us on social media, follow me on social media, and I'll let you know what's going on with all of that stuff. Um, just real quickly here getting back to uh the shipping thing yeah jeremy said shipping is a killer and so did uh so did gabriel um i gotta look into this album on frontiers but the last time i looked something up on frontiers the shipping was almost as much as the album it's it's ridiculous so a lot of times you know people complain about amazon but i don't have to pay 20 bucks to have to have an album shipped um there's emp here in europe as well but you know for example uh, anything that you order from them takes at least a week to get here it's as if you're working with old mail order in the states from uh centuries <laughs> ago <laughs> so um that is it folks i thank you once more for being here on another friday spending your time with me it is greatly appreciated that you choose to spend this time with me. Uh, it is greatly appreciated if you didn't check the show out live. I know that this time doesn't work for everyone, but if you do subscribe to the show, if you do listen to it after, or you do watch it on YouTube after, uh, I thank you for doing that. Like, subscribe, um, go to all the social media platforms where we're available. Choose the one that works best for you. We definitely go out on a lot of different um, streaming and audio platforms that you can subscribe to. And the show is on all of the major social media platforms as well. Just go to MarsAttacksRadio.com. And there's actually a section at the top of MarsAttacksRadio.com. It will show you guys. See, I'll even share my screen with you so you guys can see it. All right. So if you go to subscribe to podcast, this here, the top half shows you 
all the ways that you can listen to the show. And the bottom half shows you how you can watch the show live as it's taking place. You can listen to Mixcloud live if you're in your car. You don't want to get into an accident by having it on. <laughs> you're watching it at the same time. You can listen via Mixcloud. So there's the link. You can sign up for the newsletter. I haven't done too many things with the newsletter lately because I've been working on so many other things. And I will be sending a new newsletter out shortly. If you have not subscribed, please do so on marsattacksradio.com. Uh, I'm always evolving and trying to switch things up and do different things to make things better, to try to attract more attention, which ultimately will helpfully make everything that I'm doing here better. Um, let me go back to the site real quick and, and show you guys. So with the episode that uh, I posted today with uh, the, the, the son of Yarg here, let's go back to the snazzy website here. The episodes are transcribed. So if you come here and you say, well, what the hell is all of this? You can always close it. And just go down and check out all of the other links or just listen to the show live. But if you want to listen or read, excuse me, you can read the entire conversation here. So if you want to hear about the shenanigans that uh, Brad had to deal with last week with his uh, the one call that he mentioned, you can read all that stuff. The purpose to all of this, again, is to help draw more people to the site. The more words, the more keywords you have and all that great stuff, the better it is to draw people here. So there you have it. Uh, it's kind of a, a two-prong approach in the sense that I do it for the site, but it's also something that I can apply via my, um, my uh, a day job with my web design business and just stuff that I can... Uh, set up for people if they're looking to do that. I also do audio editing and video editing and all that stuff. And uh, I can transcribe their stuff. So there you go. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, I just felt the need to, to point all that stuff out. I apologize. Uh, I am signing off now. I take forever to say goodbye. But uh, thank you once again for listening. And we will see you next time right here on the Signals from Mars Live stream brought to you by the Mars Attacks podcast and vmrit.com. See ya next time. Goodbye.